If you would have asked me five years ago what the on-trend brewing thing would be in 2021, I never would have guessed that hard seltzer water would be so popular. Laugh all you want, but hard seltzer is a fantastic day drinker and likely isn't going anywhere in the near future. Imperial Yeast's new seasonal strain, W04 Paramount, can help brewers get the most out of their seltzer fermentations. A clean and aggressive fermenter, Paramount will produce an excellent seltzer with low fusel alcohols and it's produced in a gluten-free medium. If you've tried making seltzer with standard ale or lager strains, you know the struggle, and Imperial Yeast is here to help with W04 Paramount. Check it out at imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. Non-alcoholic beers have been around for a long time, but they've only recently increased in popularity such that it seems almost every brewery is interested in adding one to their portfolio. But there are a lot of challenges associated with non-alcoholic beer production, namely that yeast, the workhorse for making beer, is prized for its ability to make alcohol. <laughs> I'm your host, Kay Job, and today in the lab, I'm speaking with Dr. Simon Carlson about his research into Pichia cluveri, a non-saccharomyces yeast species that has a couple of features that make it suitable for brewing non-alcoholic beers. Namely, it's maltose negative and crabtree negative. And we'll talk about what both of those things mean in the show, but the takeaway is that there are other non-saccharomyces yeasts out there that might give a more beer-like flavor to non-alcoholic beer. It might be a little easier to use than using normal saccharomyces yeast. And an even bigger takeaway, combining a yeast like Pekia with some of the alternative techniques that we've talked about in other episodes on the show, like high mash temperature, cold fermentation, those might result in better and more consistent outcomes. So there's lots to discuss. There's a lot of different yeasts out there and a lot of ways that we might want to think about using those in the brewery, which we'll talk about uh, and I'll talk about with Simon. So let's get to it. But first, I wanted to say another big thank you to our patrons. None of this would be possible without you. And if you're not currently a patron, I encourage you to head over to patreon.com slash brewlosophy and check out all the rewards you get for the monthly contribution levels. In addition to the feel-good vibes of helping to support the work we do here at Brewlosophy, you get access to a bunch of awesome rewards. One of those is access to Brewlosophy contributor recipes that we've never published. Another is new discounts each month to yakimavalleyhops.com, well worth its value. And then for $3, access to a live monthly Q&A session with a special guest from the brewing industry. And this month's guest is none other than Brewlosophy contributor Will Lovell. So like me, Will got his start with Brewlosophy through the Brew Club, doing experiments there, which he can talk a lot more about. And it turns out Will's a fantastic home brewer. Um, so he adds a lot to the Brewlosophy crew. And if you're interested in learning more about Will, what he does, and talking to him about any homebrew related questions, um, he'll be available in August to answer those. Uh, I hope you'll take advantage of this great reward. Just go to patreon.com slash brewlosophy for more information. Thank you to everyone that's left a rating or review of the show. I really appreciate um, hearing from ev- all of you. Keep the reviews coming in. I love getting those. They've been largely positive and that's great. Um, I'm also interested to hear feedback. You can post those or send that to me um, via email. I read every single review and shows like the Applying the Science series with Jordan wouldn't have happened without those. So If you haven't yet left a rating or review of the show, I'd love for you to do so. Feedback this week is brought to you by Haas, who in collaboration with Yakima Valley's Brew Lot Farms developed Brew One Hops. It's a variety that packs a wallop of tropical fruit character and as hopped up IPA continues to grow in popularity, many brewers are focusing on making theirs juicy. Brew One does just that, imparting notes of ripe pineapple and stone fruit while also contributing a pleasant bitterness. Um, and of course, that little tip that I've been talking about, uh, Brew One in conduct- conjunction with Sabro makes this incredible pina colada flavor that's impossible to resist. Learn more about this tasty variety as well as the other innovative hot products Haas has to offer at johnihaas.com. That's john, the letter I-H-A-A-S.com. Continuing with feedback from Brian of the Sui Generous blog about the GMO yeast episode, which is episode 112 with Molly Browning, Laura Burns, and Avi Shaivitz, he says, near the end, Jordan, I think, mentioned that cost may make it impossible for breweries to have custom engineered yeasts. Uh, This is a a K to side. Yeah, that's where we were talking about how, you know, um, it'd be great if every brewery could just make its own yeast, but the cost of those things might make it impossible um, for breweries to custom engineer. But maybe, you know, custom engineering 
some strain results in some new publicly available varieties. Um, so Brian says, this is only actually partially true. I teach an undergrad microbiology lab course and we make GMO transgenic bacteria as part of the course. I'm able to do this on a shoestring budget with a cost totaling less than $50 in materials per GMO organism made. That's pretty incredible. It also takes only one person about 12 hours of actual hands-on work to make and validate one of these GMOs, keeping salary costs reasonable. The cost and time to make GMO yeasts are roughly equivalent. The reason GMO yeast and other GMOs are so costly is because of regulatory burdens. The rules vary country to country, but even minimally modified organisms require the manufacturer to spend tens, if not hundreds of times, uh, what it took to engineer the organism to just complete the paperwork and registration procedures. That costs a lot of money in salaries alone, never mind the various fees that are often charged and in some cases the need to pay a third-party lab to perform some safety testing. This not making the GMOs itself is where most of the costs come from. So given the 40-year history of GMO safety, this will hopefully change, but one day, um, uh, and this will hopefully change to one day become less burdensome. Yeah, thanks for the comment, Brian. That's really, really interesting. I had no idea the, like, the actual cost of uh, what it takes to make a GMO organism. I'm assuming it's more, you know, $50 of materials is kind of like each individual GMO organism and there's some uh, other equipment and stuff that needs to be purchased. But sure, the more you do it, the cheaper the cost gets um, with, with equipment. And that's totally true. The regulatory burden of GMOs, I could certainly see that's where a lot of the costs are coming from. And also one of the reasons why Avi and Molly and Laura and Chaz wrote that article is because there seems to be a lot of misunderstanding about safety. So there's going to be a cost of communication, right? Getting this out there and communicating, um, you know, to two people that, like you said, there's a 40 year history of GMO safety um, that people, uh, you know, either don't understand, don't want to understand or haven't been exposed to. But there's a whole set of communication issues that we got to sort through there uh, anyway. So, yeah, thanks, Brian, uh, for the awesome comments and great insight. I'll be back in a few minutes with Dr. Simon Carlson about non-Saccharomyces yeast that might be suitable for non-alcoholic beer production. One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel. And Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on high quality stainless gear. Like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow off, and it can hold up to 4 psi of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest priced all in one electric brew systems out there. And their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. Yeast is amazingly complicated for a single cell organism, and it's incredibly well attuned to perform its job in alcoholic fermentations. But recently, we've been asking yeast to do things that they're not necessarily built to do in making low and no alcohol beers. Thus, the search for new microorganisms to help populate this growing market segment. With me today at the lab to talk about maltose and crabtree negative yeasts is Dr. Simon Carlson from Christian Hansen in Denmark. Simon, welcome to the Brew Lab. Thank you. And thank you for having me here. It's very excited to be beyond the show. I know. I'm excited to have you. So Simon gave a detailed talk about non-traditional yeast at the annual meeting of the American Society of Brewing Chemists. And uh, he and I started talking about it. And I realized, hey, he, this is a perfect guest to come and talk to us about different ways to make alcohol, non-alcoholic and low-alcohol beers, but specifically by using yeast. And so this is actually a particular focus of yours, isn't it, Simon? Uh, definitely. I've been working for the last five years in, in Christian Hansen, uh, especially developing new product uh, for the non-alcoholic and, and no alcohol and also alcohol-free now uh, beer segments. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, specifically, you found a, a, a specific yeast. Uh, well, I don't know if it's a yeast. We'll get into that in a minute. But a specific microorganism uh, that's uh, near um, is the, the brand name that, that you guys use there at Christian Hansen. And that's a, a, a specific microorganism that ferments very well in the non-alcohol and low-alcohol beer space, right? Yeah, it's it's an, an yeast, uh, a yeast, and it came out of our wine program. So, uh, most people in the brewing industry don't not really know Christian Hansen. We are, although a very old company and global company, the company is 149 years old. But we have a background primarily in, in dairy, where we supply all the big dairies around the world uh, with bacteria. Wow! But out of that segment and the knowledge of bacteria, we we started in, also in wine uh, business and wine making, where we produced malolactic bacteria, and from there into a wine yeast. And from wine yeast and our wine program, we actually isolated this uh, first near yeast, which is indeed a yeast, as you you alluded to. And uh, yeah, it's uh, Pika Clovery, and it's isolated from uh, grapes in New Zealand. And it was actually meant to be a, a pre-fermentative yeast for winemaking. So in, in yeast, uh, sorry, in winemaking, you have the pre-fermentation going on in most winemaking. You have a pre-fermentation with different non-saccharomyces yeast. You have uh, alcoholic fermentation with saccharomyces yeast, and you have a malolactic fermentation. So, so this uh, particular microorganism was uh, uh, found in a search for pre-fermentative yeast. But during that work, it was realized that it probably actually would work well for a non-alcoholic beer, and we then started testing that. And it actually a student, a master student, did that that with the work, and it came to actually be a product now on the market, and been yeah, more a little bit more than five years on the market now. Wow. Wow, that's really cool. How interesting how all of this stuff comes to be, right? I mean, you're 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 in wine, right? And trying to find a, a solution for a particular problem with wine, and start thinking, well, we might be able to use this in beer, and thus a uh, a new yeast is found and discovered and, and used. Uh, so we're gonna get into all of that. We're gonna talk about not only uh, Picia cluveri, but also other you know maltose and uh, non uh, maltose negative and crabtree negative yeast, and we'll talk about what both of those things mean. But first, I always like to just start the show with um, introducing you. So you are the principal application scientist for wine and fermented beverages at Christian Hansen. Um, and so how did you become interested in studying fermented beverages or beer and wine and all that? <laughs> yeah, it's depending on how, how far you want to go back and uh, to answer <laughs> that question. But at least I would, I would say I would have to go back to, to grad school. Uh, I did my PhD at the Czech University of Denmark. But part of that, I, I got to be a visiting scholar at MIT. Oh, cool. So I, I, I spent quite some time there. And uh, during my stay at the Department of Chemical Engineering at MIT, um, doing molecular biology and metabolic engineering work, I found that the, they had homebrew competition at the, the department. And the nearest bar had, you know, so many different beers on, on tap. You know, the, the cold craft scene had, was so much more evolved than what we had in Denmark. So, so I really, you know, saw this huge difference. And... When after moving back, getting my first job as a research scientist, starting to make a lot of money, I decided I wanted to pick up a new hobby. And I was like, oh, maybe I should try, you know, fermenting stuff. So I actually started fermenting fruit wines from whatever fruits I could find around during summer time in Denmark. And then as uh, summer you know, ended, you know, the supply of fruit, you know, came to an end. <laughs> right. So I thought, okay, I, I need to ferment something. You know, I, I did my PhD in yeast. I really want to do something with yeast and make some actual products. So uh, for, from there on, you know, brewing was obvious. And I think that's more like 12, 13 years back now. And I've been brewing ever since, uh, finishing grad school. And at some point, five years, six years uh, back, um, I saw this job opportunity at Christian Hansen where they said, oh, we're looking for an application manager slash specialist. And I thought, okay, why not give it a try? So I, you know, I applied for the job and really thought, you know, this could be the perfect combination of my passion for brewing and my yeast background and knowledge. And I was lucky enough that they they hired me, and I've, as I said, for the last five years, been working on on uh, helping brewers around the world do uh, non-alcoholic beer, uh, also working on new product development, and also helping sales troubleshoot issues at customers. Yeah, yeah, it w which is really cool, right? To to think about like all the research that you've been doing over the last five years. So like you went to grad school, um, and was it molecular biology? Is that what you said? Your your sort yeah, of and uh, and. And metabolic engineering. So yeah. I basically worked on producing different secondary metabolites using yeast. 
Ah, yeah. So with like very deep knowledge of yeast and then start working at Christian Hansen and then, you know, expanding their wine and fermented beverage product offerings, which is really cool. And that, of course, gets us to what we're talking about today, which is um, your work that you've done in non-alcohol and low alcohol production using these specialized yeast strains. So the goal for today or the idea for this episode is kind of broadly discuss yeast metabolism so we can understand what we mean by maltose negative and crabtree negative, and then discuss some of the special yeast strains that could be used in production with kind of a particular emphasis on this Picchia cluveri, um, which is uh, one of your particular um, research interests. So I think it's going to be a really fun, fun show, but we should start at the top. And I think we have to start with talking about yeast metabolism. So we kind of understand why would specialty yeast be needed and why can't regular Saccharomyces cerevisiae or maybe why aren't Saccharomyces cerevisiae attuned to, um, you know, non-alcoholic production. So how does yeast turn sugar into alcohol and CO2? Let's start right there. Yeast metabolism. So... (laughs) Regular brewers yeast, of course, have what is called glycolysis, and through glycolysis, it converts the sugars into pyruvate. Uh, but doing so, it uses cofactors, and to regenerate those cofactors uh, under anaerobic conditions, it needs some way of doing that, and, and it does it by fermentation. So either it makes alcohol, but other, other yeast can make lactic acid, and during making alcohol or from, from pyruvate to acetaldehyde, and from acetaldehyde to ethanol, you basically regenerate the cofactor that you spent uh, doing glycolysis. Um, that's it. That happens primarily during the lack of oxygen, because with oxygen, you would have what is called the electron transport chain, and there you would have oxygen as the final uh, electron acceptor, and it's a, a process where the yeast cell gains much more energy, so normally that would be preferred. Um, however, yeast like uh, our brewer's yeast, Saccharomyces, has this overflow metabolism that is known as Crabtree effect. And that basically means even though there is oxygen above, above a certain sugar th- threshold, this this yeast and the, uh, the species of Saccharomyces cerevisiae would actually do aerobic fermentation, meaning even though there's oxygen present, it will ferment the sugars into alcohol. And that happens, I think the threshold is about 0.2 gram per liter of sugar, so very low. So, and that's why even in the beginning of your brewing, you will start see alcohol being produced from from the beginning. Yeah, e- like even the, the at the very beginning of the uh, of the fermentation. So you said like the electron transport chain with oxygen as the terminal acceptor. That's kind of like humans, right? Like human cells use that method to respire. Exactly. Exactly. And so so then um, yeast. So again, so this is kind of a key point here. So yeast has this special ability called Crabtree effect, um, which allows them to regenerate those cofactors quicker um, using fermentation so that they can continue glycolysis, which is their major like energy production mechanism. Yeah. And, and also, I guess it's, it's very handy when you're in a small niche out of nature, for example, and you want to compete for sh- for sugars, the faster you can take these up and metabolize them, the less they'll be available for competition. And if you, in the same time, can produce something that is toxic to your competitor, then you get an even further benefit. Ah, like ethanol or CO2, uh, potentially Ethanol, toxic. CO2. Ethanol, yeah. I was thinking of, but CO2 at a bit higher level would also start being toxic. But again, at high levels, it will also be toxic to the yeast itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ethanol being the primary one, right? I mean, ethanol being super toxic to a lot of stuff. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we don't really have um, uh, pathogenic concerns with um, alcoholic beer, right? Uh, because all, any of those bacteria are killed off by ethanol um, and CO2 for, for that matter, but mostly ethanol. Um, but yeah, so so this is really interesting. And this is kind of the, one of the things I, I took a fermentation microbiology class here from Dr. Chris Curtin at Oregon State. And this was one of the big takeaways for me is this is kind of an evolutionary um, benefit of, uh, you know, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, this whole, or these Crabtree um, uh, positive yeasts, because they have this ability to re- very quickly generate cofactors, right, and regenerate so that they can continue their energy production. And that gives them this huge niche in terms of alcoholic fermentation. So for us as humans, how we want, you know, yeast to produce beer and produce alcohol, it does it really quick. And so that's why we can get fermentations that happen, you know, in as little as three or four or five days 
days or a week or something like that. Um, and it's the same thing with wine yeast. You know, they have their crab, pro- the, the Saccharomyces um, that's used in wine fermentations are also crab tree positive. So I guess I was going to ask this question of you, but I think I might have just stated it. So does what does crab tree effect do for the yeast? So it, it, it gives it a competitive advantage, right? It does. And, and you can say in former times where you didn't have the pure cultures, right? Then when you do brewing in a open bucket or open, uh, yeah, what do you call it? The Yorkshire square yeah, yeah. or whatever they used to use, then um, clearly you would have other yeast and microorganisms falling into that. So the, there it's a clear advantage. But since we have now steel tanks, they can be CIP'd and disinfected. And and uh, Carlsberg, Emil Christian Hansen at Carlsberg Laboratories isolated the first pure yeast strains, and the whole brewing industry turns, you know, to pure strains. This advantage is, 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 I would say, not as required anymore because you know everything is pure, purified, disinfected, so you only have one strain in there. But another interesting note on that is actually, you know, humans kind of domesticated yeast in that sense, right? We took it into the brewers and we kept growing the same yeast, and I think. Quite yeast is a very interesting uh, niche of yeast that are domesticating because in Norway they just continue what they used to do. And in that way, they have made these amazing strains that can handle super high temperatures. But effectively, the discovery that Carlsberg, of course, would make a, a higher quality of beer, and that was why a lot of people switched to that, effectively also stopped that domesticating and evolution that humans uh, or brewers and yeast was doing hand in hand, right? Oh yeah, that's interesting, right? Yeah, because you're 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 repitching yeast that makes good flavors and ferments beer and and ferments beer quickly and all that. So you are you're 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 applying selective pressure in humans. We're doing that, but now once you're just using single isolates, you know it's not competing anymore. It's not having to evolve as as quickly or rapidly to survive. No, and then after a certain number of generations, you discard all the yeast and you go go back to the original starting point, growing from a a vial or again, right? So. You basically don't have any domesticating. You don't, you don't have any evolution going on or adaptations. Right. Nothing, right? You're just, yeah, you, I, exactly. After serially repitching, you throw it out and start back over. Or or you've propagated up a new uh, a new from a, from a slant or something like that. And that's it's, a, it's that's quite interesting that, you know, when, when they introduced this technique, I was thinking in a lot of places in Germany and England, um, people felt, uh, felt that the beer was getting empty. Like the, some of the flavors they used were used to from other yeast that was in there. Like uh, in, in England, Britannomyces was a big thing, right? All of a sudden, you didn't have that. And of course, that has an impact of the final flavor profile of the beer. And, and without that, you know, some people felt the beer was empty. And I think we're seeing now also the craft scene embracing that with multiple strains, new strains, non saccharomyces strain, other strains coming into the picture. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody's always looking for new flavors. I mean, certainly and it is it, always I mean, it seems so obvious like to you and I, right, uh, to, that we would just pitch the one yeast because that's what most people do now in modern modern times. But it, you can actually develop new flavors by pitching multiple yeast, right? You can do co-pitches. There's nothing that stops you from pitching a couple of different types of yeast, not just, you know, Britannomyces and, you know, Saccharomyces, but you can pitch different Saccharomyces strains and get different flavor profiles or, you know, something like a picky a cluveri with a saccharomyces and get maybe some different flow, uh, flavor flow, flavor profiles as well but you're going to come up against this whole crab tree um you know thing that's going to give yeast a competitive advantage if you start doing a whole bunch of co-pitching so i think i understand crab tree effect now essentially that helps the yeast uh ferment uh, alcohol and do it very quickly right it gives them sort of a competitive advantage in that space in the making of alcohol the other thing that saccharomyces are um is they can ferment maltose um so talk to us about maltose and why uh, that's important for beer brewing of course maltose being the, the dominant sugar in in in, uh, in word uh, hence the name right it's it's uh, quite interesting that that sugar compared to for example sucrose which is also a disaccharide is maltose is taken into the cells before it's cleaved, whereas sucrose is cleaved outside the cell. Uh, and and of course you have again one chain, uh, one glucose longer than you have maltotriose. And there you can see you have some yeasts even within the saccharomyces space that can use the maltotriose, and, and therefore you have higher attenuation. Uh, but not all saccharomyces can do that. And and you can simply say, okay, some some yeasts have not evolved to do that because they have all evolved in other niches. And and there, for example, Pikia as we were talking about, Clavary cannot even take the maltose. It can only take monosaccharides. So it probably don't have the, even the, the transporters to take it up. 
Yeah, and that makes sense, right? In their fermentation environment, like you raise you raise sucrose, right? That's the primary sugar in wine grapes, right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. the it's a very different sugar. It's a glucose and a fructose bound together, whereas maltose is two glucose molecules. Um, and so you've got a very different mechanism. So Picchia cluveri, which has been um, you know isolated in uh, wine strains, right? It's for, as wine as a pre fermentation, like you mentioned earlier. It's not built to do maltose because it was never in an environment where it needed to consume my maltose right nope and 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 you know it's a little bit of chicken egg what came first right because since it cannot take maltose why would it be able to grow there so it would be never co- com- go in there because it would, would simply would be out competed um, the alcohol tolerance of pk is not very high it's about three or four percent alcohol so in that case you know saccharomyces would have out competed so quickly yeah, right. Exactly. And I guess that's where it makes sense, right? This is it's a pre fermentation. Like you said, I'm, I'm starting to paint the picture um, of this. It's a pre fermentation yeast. And then you add uh, Saccharomyces to it to take over and ferment and do the alcohol. Um, and then the malolactic fermentation to kind of round out round out the, the body or feel or at least that's my understanding. I'm not really a winemaker, but I, that's my understanding of what's going on during the wine process. Me neither, but you know, I have a, a bunch of colleagues that is is very much into wine, so you know, they they're trying to teach me that stuff, and and you're you're absolutely correct. That's that's also my understanding. All right, well, good. Okay, so I think then, so so some um uh, um some yeasts then cannot uh, use maltose to generate energy, right? That's kind of the other big takeaway. That's what we're talking about when we say maltose negative. So like Picchia cluveri is an example of that. It can't consume and use maltose, unlike Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So if you put it into beer, it's only going to ferment uh, what? I mean, would, would it ferment anything? It will ferment the monosaccharides, and, and the glucose and the fructose makes up about 10% of the total sugars in, in, a, in a word. So, so there's a little bit and if you then control the amount of monosaccharides by controlling the total word strength, you can easily prevent it from being higher alcohol produced than, than 0.5%. Normally, we see around nine plates, so would give you about 0.5% of the alcohol from, from monosaccharides. 0.5%. But, but, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and and that, in its, its own right, nine plates, so with 10% lost, you're going to lose about one plate of sugar, so you're only going to drop from nine plates to eight. It's going to be cloyingly sweet because all the maltose, the maltose trials, and so on, will be lagging. So, so you need to do a little bit of different changes when you work with these yeast. So, for example, we normally brew about five to six plato, which has the added benefit that you know you don't use a lot of malt, and and malt with malt prices going up with this, the cost of making the malt in terms of CO two and energy they're also increasing, right? Then it's, the more you can save on that, the, the better. Then normally the follow up question that I get on when you say five to six plato is you know. Is that going to be very wordy <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, very sorry watery? And and and, and we see that this yeast, uh, especially pika, uh, helps a lot with the mouthfeel and the the, the body, right? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, right. Because if you're just down at like five or six Play-Doh, which for the homebrewers out there, that's what, um, you know, 20 or, or 24, um, uh, 10, 20, 10, 24 uh, starting gravity. Yeah, I mean, that's really low, right? And you would think, yeah, it's just going to be a watery beer um, if it does that. And so that's just where you get into some of these other characteristics of these yeasts, right? What do they taste like? What do they contribute to the beer other than uh, just their fermentation profile? Because that's important. You can take those monosaccharides, the glucose and fructose that's present in wort, and then make a low alcohol beer um we'll talk actually i guess we should do it right now there's a distinction right in the law about alcohol free versus non-alcohol versus like low alcohol beers there those things can mean different things in different countries right yeah uh, yeah and then we normally use like use the the british definition of that where we, we define uh non-alcoholic as less than 0.5 percent alcohol and, and alcohol free as 0.05 percent alcohol that said, in, in the U.S., uh, I think it's the TTB governing that. The, 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 the laws, uh, the rule says that it basically means no detectable alcohol. <laughs> uh, but with analytical equipment getting so good, you know, that's virtually impossible. So at some point, I guess the TTB, if that, if I'm correct, they they should have some kind of stand on that and say, okay, <laughs> we need to define that level. Right. It's got to be at least something like 0.05, right? Or po- and not just 0.5. Because I think you can say alcohol or non-alcoholic beer here in the United States as long as it's less than 0.5, which I think is similar to the UK. Uh, but yeah, you know, to, to, to claim that it's alcohol free. And of course, there's other countries where alcohol is completely banned, right? I mean, where you can't serve alcohol, but you but if you have a beer that doesn't have alcohol in it, um, you know, meaning like 0.0, uh, you could then sell that beer in those countries, which is a pretty cool um uh opportunity 
So definitely, and 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 another interesting point here is that you bringing up is that these countries is is not only that there can be no alcohol in, there can be no alcohol in doing all the processing, meaning during the alcoholization, you, you have alcoholic beer, right, that you remove the alcohol, and, and those beer would not be allowed in, in those countries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because uh, there had been alcohol in, and, and there these specialty yeast where you don't produce any alcohol uh, comes in. Yeah, this is where the specialty yeast really can take place if you're trying to make low or no alcohol beers. Um, okay, I want to talk about the different ways that we can produce non-alcohol and low alcohol beers, but... I think we should spend just like one, maybe one minute really quick talking about taxonomy. So I keep using the word yeast, right? And and we keep using that. And I want to understand like what we mean by the word yeast, because Picia cluveri is an entirely different genus of, uh, of organism than Saccharomyces. It's just an entirely different, you know, than like Lachancia thermotolerans, which we've talked about on this show before, which is a, quote, yeast <laughs> that ferments alcohol and lactic acid, but it's very much not Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So I guess my question for you then is, is there a point in like the genetic tree where organisms start be- stop being considered yeast and stop being and start being considered something else or do we just kind of use the term yeast as you know something that we can put in alcoholic beverages <laughs> no, of course it stops somewhere right yeah yeah of course. Uh, it has to because <laughs> um yeah and then yeast uh, belong as you said your organism as you said and there's you normally discriminate we try two types of yeast depending on how they they propagate uh, and one uh, one is a uh, fishing yeast uh, where you you have like just you know split in two, and the other one is like like almost like a bacteria where it comes in, in two, two halves, and then you have your like your saccharomyces where they are budding, so you have budding yeast and you have fishing yeast. So those are the two normal typical, but they are uh, both types of yeast. And then yeast belongs to the fungi kingdom, uh, and fungi then again belongs to the eukaryotes. And in eukaryotes you have plants, uh, you have humans, animals, etc. Right. So so it's it's just this whole tree of life. So it's just uh, a way of categorizing and, and putting, you know, into small boxes, so to say, you know, organisms that, that's that's similar to each other. And of course, the yeast bo- box has a, a boundary at some point, right? <laughs> right, right. But maybe to a little bit too amorphous um, <laughs> for, for the show. I, I think maybe then I can just discuss the, like talk about them as, as um, you know, things that are similar, things that are single cell organisms that do some sort of either fermentation or produce something that might be uh, useful or interesting to us in uh, alcoholic beverages, at least just for this episode. Uh, we can talk yep. about yeast in that box. Okay, uh, let's talk non-alcohol and low-alcohol beer production. Now, we've talked about several methods on this show before. We've talked about um, you know high mash temperature. Uh, we've talked about cold fermentation. Um, we've talked about arrested fermentation, so stopping the fermentation early. And we've sort of mentioned um, dealkalization, where you're you know brewing an alcoholic beer and then either distilling out the alcohol or membrane filtering out the alcohol. So my question for you, Simon, then is where do these specialty yeasts or or these um, maltose negative and crabtree negative yeast fit into this whole uh, pr- uh, production process. Yeah, so so in general, when it comes to making non-alcoholic and alcohol-free beer in literature and, and in science, general, people like to split it in two parts. You know, the technical removal of alcohol, and there are several ways of doing that: membranes, uh, the thermal dealkalization, spinning cones, etc. And then you have the biological approaches, where you have uh, stock fermentation, cold contact, and and specialty yeast. And and that's really where specialty to yeast fit in, uh, and it's uh, yeah. And you can also say the the optimized mashing process. And in general, I'm a strong believer that you know all of these processes have to come together, especially within the biological segment, to 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 make a good beer. So, for example, as we mentioned before, with the maltose negative yeast, you will have all the maltose left over in your final beer, and that will give you residual sweetness that you're not interested in. So, the more you can limit in your mashing, meaning if you mash in very high, where you only have alpha amylase activity, you can limit the, or have, avoid the beta amylase activity, you don't get the maltose, or you get less maltose, and then thereby you can re- limit the residual sweetness that is then in the beers made with specialty yeast. Then we talked alcohol-free beer, and, and I know we will get back to that, but but there, the trick is basically to make the yeast respire instead of fermenting, uh, and going back to the crab tree effect. And, and there we will also have residual monosaccharides because it's simply impossible to respire away all the monosaccharides. So you also have to stop the fermentation by cooling. So there you bring in the trick from the stock fermentation approach. So, so, so you can see how these things you know, start to play together. And 
you bring in the specialty yeast, you bring in the cold contact, you bring in the not, uh, not cold contact, so stock fermentation, you bring in the mashing regime, and all together that way you can can try to make better beer, a better non-alcoholic beer. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It's like using all of the tools up to this point, right? So using the high mash temperature, using the um, stops or arrested fermentation uh, to to uh, you know tweak. It's there's still levers that you can pull. So these yeasts are you you could use them sort of like you would use a Saccharomyces, but maybe these have some different advantages uh, that that uh, the the Saccharomyces wouldn't have. So what might be some like, advantages of these specialty yeast over like normal Saccharomyces? So yeah, first of all, of course, the maltose negative, which is required to avoid the alcohol formation in a zero five beer. Then I would say high ester from production. You know, helping mask some of the woody flavor when you get a lot of esters. Uh, so especially Pika is very good at making esters. When uh, my technicians are working with this, these strains, just a couple of acre plates in the lab that has been open, I can walk in the door and I'm not a, not in doubt what they're working on. Uh, <laughs> you can smell it's, it. It's that wow. that aromatic. Um, <laughs> Then they also have to be very good at reducing aldehydes. Uh, so for people that don't know, but the most of the wordy flavors, the grainy that you haven't worked, it's, it's aldehyde. And those uh, compounds need to be reduced uh, to avoid having this word flavor in, in the final uh, non-alcoholic beer. That's something that Saccharomyces does, right? Like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, actually, um, it produces aldehydes and then it also takes back up those aldehydes, which is why beer doesn't taste wordy. It doesn't taste like starchy potato starch or any of those things, or grainy. Yeah. Yes, and, and in, in non-alcoholic beer, that becomes even more important because uh, the flavor threshold, the detection odor threshold for, for these uh, compounds depends on the matrix. So... The lower the alcohol, the higher the tendencies of these molecules to come out of solution with. So the odor threshold goes down when alcohol goes down. Oh, interesting. And meaning yeah. it becomes even more important in, in non-alcoholic and alcohol-free beer to have very limited amount of aldehydes because the way that the matrix is changing is actually promoting the, uh, the perception of these molecules. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and so it... it uh, so that that's really uh, that um, i'm sorry my mind is blown a little bit there for a second because that's the first time i had heard that so the 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 aldehol or the aldehyde uh flavor threshold actually goes down as alcohol goes down so you're getting more perception of aldehydes with lower alcohol in the lower alcohol beers that's really interesting that's fascinating um you know because that is a big deal and that was one of the things um that i've talked about on prior episodes before about that's a challenge with non-alcoholic beers is you get this wordy flavor and it's largely because nothing is in there reducing those aldehydes or taking them back down. And that's where these specialty yeasts can come in and help. Yeah, and it's not only the alcohol, also higher sugar levels promote uh, the perception of, of aldehydes. So so it's actually a very tricky situation that you want. So, so it's the importance of having yeast that can reduce these as much as possible just become extra important. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it sounds like, and so so there are some um, kind of unique ven- benefits of using specialty yeast, even when combined with you know, let's say high mash temperature, for example. If you produce a very high, uh, you know, high mash temperature, a very dextrinous wort using only the alpha amylase, as you mentioned earlier, you're not getting um, you know maltose or you know glucose and fructose, those like sweet sugars. You're just getting um, the long train dextrins, which aren't as sweet, and maybe you have a little bit of uh, mouthfeel and body, and then you know you let ferment with these a specialty yeast and that might produce a very nice well-rounded beer that actually tastes like a beer <laughs> you know uh, which is the exactly goal. <laughs> uh, and it also you know th- this effect we talked about before doesn't only apply to the aldehydes right it, it applies to all aroma molecules in some extent and and it's not linear per se right uh, so just to, I think a lot of people need to understand that when you make a non alcoholic beer, you cannot just make a one to one scale down version of your regular beer. <laughs> you really need to work with the recipe. You need to balance it. You need to understand how these things change. And, and, and it takes a couple of trials. Normally we see like two to three trials with, with special yeast and you are, you have a good product, right? But, but just to think you can take a, what you know one to one with the regular psychomyces doesn't apply and it doesn't apply because what we just talked about with with the whole matrix changing mm, oh totally i mean i i i've uh, noticed that personally myself with bitterness right i mean if you just scale down your hop bitterness addition you're going to get a very very bitter beer <laughs> or a very very bitter non-alcoholic beer for sure and and that's another point right because the ethanol also if you do late hopping and dry hopping help extract some of these more hydrophobic <laughs> molecules and right. you, you don't have any alcohol to do that right so 
That's right. So you're, you're yeah, yeah, you're, uh, you're dry hopping and stuff may be very different. It's going to be, uh, you might even get totally different flavors uh, when dry hopping a non-alcoholic beer than an alcoholic beer. Well, and Christian Hansen's been doing a lot of research in this area. I mean, specifically, we talked about the Picchia Cluveri, um, but you've also looked at some other yeasts. And so I want to jump into that. We need to take a quick break, though. And when we come back, we'll talk about some of these different specialty yeast strains, how they work, how you can use them, and get some general tips and tricks for making low alcohol and no alcohol beer. We'll be right back. The new Brewbuilt X2 Unitank Conical Fermenter is here, and it's ready to take your brewing game to the next level. With the best interior finish, welded and polished ferrules, clear bottom chamber, pressurizable with body connect fittings, etc., Brewbuilt has managed to bring commercial level features into the home brewing world at an unbeatable price. Now available with a professional grade glycol jacket, giving you a more sanitary environment and much greater cooling efficiency, say goodbye to clunky immersion coils with the game changing jacketed X2. Visit morebeer.com to learn more. Watching the growth of the no alcohol and low alcohol beer segment in the U.S. has been a lot of fun. It seems like only a few years ago there were only one or two offerings, and now there's an entire section almost at the grocery store of these low and no alcohol beers. And I don't know about you, Simon, but I've been trying to actually sample through these um, as they rotate through the different offerings and varieties. Do you enjoy non-alcoholic and low alcohol beers? I, I do, and you know, you always have these special occasions where you know you can't have a regular beer, and then for those, you know. I enjoy having one, and I have to say, of course, like with other beers, you know, you always have your preferences and, and your styles that you go for. But yeah, in general, I I really enjoy them. Uh, but you also, as you mentioned, the U.S. you know uh, being moving forward and getting getting more accepted. And I have to say, when I I mean, of course I'm based in Europe, and and I think in, in, normally we, we see a lot of things from the U.S. move over here. But in terms of non alcoholic beer, I think Europe is is actually a bit ahead. Uh, and I think the one of the reasons is that, that the U.S. has been a little bit scarred by some of the first, you know, uh, examples that was really, really bad, and uh, <laughs> the yeah. consumers has been a, a bit reluctant to move back. But uh, but we also see that talking with brewers in the U.S. that they they starting to understand that this is uh, the segment and uh, the probably the fastest growing segment in brewing right now, and 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 it's really where the competition is happening. And when we, we work with brewers, then they're not they like very secretive about the recipe. They they're really not sharing anything with other brewers. They 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 don't even want us to share that they're working with our yeast, so of course we keep that secret when there's brewers using it. Uh, so I wouldn't even be allowed to tell you which beers in the U.S. is made with our yeast. <laughs> uh, and it just goes to show, right, that that this is the the, the new because when it comes to regular brewing, the brewers is normally very friendly, opening and, and sharing about this. But but especially with non-alcoholic, there seems to be a bit more secrecy going on. <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah, because I have generally been my experience that brewers are very open and willing to share recipes or, you know, best practices or anything like that. But, you know, non-alcoholic beers, there's challenges like you mentioned. I mean, there's challenges with, you know, changing your recipe. There's challenges with, uh, you know, changing your mashing regime. There's change challenges with a new yeast species, right? I think a lot of brewers might be uh, worried about using something like Pikia, um, it, you know, and it contaminating some of their other fermentations. Not that that necessarily would happen. They might just be um, a afraid of that. And then also there's a little bit of a safety concern too with non-alcoholic beer, right? Without the alcohol and with a higher pH generally, um, although you can adjust the pH, but without those two things, um, non-alcoholic beer becomes much more susceptible to some of these other, um, you know, contamination organisms getting into it, right? Yeah. And not even contamination organisms. Sometimes the biggest enemy when it comes to non-alcoholic beer is you're actually your brewer's yeast because your whole brewery is full of it. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, um, <laughs> And and you know that's also why we normally recommend that you you get a tongue pasteurizer. That said, we have brewers that has gone away with sterile filtering the beer uh, before filling it or uh, flash pasteurizing, but it put very high requirements on uh, the filling line itself. Right, it need to be very very clean and 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 it's also always a risk if you don't uh, bottle pasteurize or, or tunnel pasteurize. So, yeah. It, both in terms of uh, spotted organism, but also in terms of you know bloating cans, bo exploding bottles, uh, yeah, or alcohol, alcohol level going yeah. out of spec. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, 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 the, the Saccharomyces yeast will have a fantastic time in there, right? Because <laughs> the maltose is all left over for it to to, yeah, yeah, like a buffet. 
it's all there, right? It has a, it's just a buffet. If you've got any yeast that's left in that beer, um, you know, I mean, any micro uh, micro uh, breweries that are out there are like small breweries that are just packaging their non-alcoholic beers on their regular packaging line. This is a big deal. You got to watch out for this and make sure that you're pack- you're pasteurizing or or uh, you know lowering the pH or you know even even lowering the pH probably won't help avoid Saccharomyces cerevisiae too much. But you've got to maintain it. We watch out for this stuff. Or yeah, you're gonna uh, be putting beer out there that you're labeling as alcohol free or non-alcoholic and it might actually be you know one or two or three percent whenever um the yeast gets through with it but okay um so i want to spend like most of this segment talking about this pikia cluveri this near yeast um mainly because that's a big focus of yours but again um i would like to share some other um uh yeast species that we might also be able to use as specialty yeast but we will spend most of the time talking about with uh, about this pikia cluveri um so that's the name of the organism, right? Pikia cluveri. Can you tell us about it? I mean, you said it was sort of sourced from pre-fermentation uh, wine. Maybe tell us about it, where it's from, what are its unique characteristics, how do you use it, all that stuff. We don't have to just, you know, jump into it all at once. We can break it out. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll start there. Yeah, I think we touched about most of these points already. But yeah, it's it's a unique yeast. And, and not all Pikia species, like not all Saccharomyces species uh, strains are the same, right? So we did a huge job going through several uh, strains before we, f- we found this one. Uh, and, and really one of the key things we, we looked for was um, ester production, and uh, not only ester production, but especially isomer acetate uh, to ethyl acetate, because we don't want the, the solventy flavor of the ethyl acetate, but we want the nice banana fruity character of, of, of the isomer acetate. And, and the ratio between the two was actually one of the selection criteria that we use for, for selecting this specifically near strain. And um, no, when we when you say isomer acetate to, to brew us the automatic thing, hefe weiss, banana, right? Right, yeah. Uh, but 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 that's not the case with this yeast. What we, we normally hear as the descriptors when people brew this is peak, uh, and, and and also sometimes pear, uh, but in general, uh, quite fruit forward, uh, and and very nice strain. I personally prefer it in um, IPAs and and so non alcoholic IPAs and pale ales. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. So it's it's got a very fruit fruity flavor to it, and and that's that's a, a interesting point, right? I mean, we think about like uh, with when we're designing regular alcoholic beer recipes, we're looking at what the contribution the yeast gives us, right? We're looking at esters or you know what flavor profiles that the yeast is gonna you gonna do, and I think sometimes that that may get a little bit lost, right? Whenever you're uh, making a non alcoholic beer, you're just looking for a beer that just ferments just a little bit and gives you quote fermentation character right I've heard that a lot where it's like okay we just want some fermentation character because that's what makes it taste more like beer but no beer is a whole bunch of other things it's esters it's aldehydes it's alcohol it's all of these other flavor profiles and so you have to consider those you have to consider what yeast what you know am I putting in here and what kinds of esters and and production is it giving you and then another thing um, I had Scott LaFontaine on the show back oh I don't know probably a year ago maybe at least six months, um, where he did research looking at the different uh, flavor profiles that consumers prefer. And overwhelmingly, uh, consumers preferred fruity um, and tropical and juicy as flavors uh, for non-alcoholic beers. So it sounds like this Pikia Cluvera fits like right in that niche. It, it fits very well there. And um, yeah, it's also this thing you're talking about all these different aroma compounds. And, and it's it doesn't seem like... Um, New to brewers, when you say you have different psychomyces strain, that each strain has its own <laughs> fingerprint. Yeah. But it's quite interesting when you start talking non psychomyces of course, these strain will also have their own fingerprint, right? Right. Uh, and, 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 and so, for, as I see it, for new product development, if you want to bring a new product to market, it's quite a lot, lot easier. But we also see big brewers that want to mimic existing alcoholic brands. And of course, that is much more difficult because they want to mimic something that made with a yeast that has one aroma fingerprint with a yeast that has another aroma fingerprint and, and filling that gap and trying to make the non saccharomyces behave like exactly like the saccharomyces is close to impossible. And, and that's where, you know, natural flavors and the flavor houses come in. Uh, so, so I would say it's much easier to make a new product compared to mimicking an existing one. But that said, we also realized that, you know, there are multiple strains that have different within Pikia. So we are just about to launch two new strains. Uh, coming out with have uh, uh, one that is a bit more fruity than the original and one that is more subdued to, to make more neutral styles uh, like uh, lagers 
Yeah, yeah, like uh, like lagers or beer, or what, what I call beer flavored beer, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it, it, that's really interesting. It, like the, your point about brewers that they uh, that the, they don't seem to think that like, oh yeah, it's just Pichia Cluveri, and so that's the only one, right? And that's that's it. And so um, there, but there are there are multiple strains of those, and they have different uh, d- different rules and different org- different roles and different organisms. Um, so how do you go about like isolating the the strain or like picking which strain? Um, you know, you want you want to uh, bring to market. So it it really depends on the project and, and what strains we want to bring to market. Uh, but in theory, you could go to to the nature. And I I went to actually and I isolated actually a picky from my backyard. Oh wow! Uh, <laughs> okay. So yeah, uh, just to uh, we had some acre plates and went sampling from different flowers and leaves, uh, grass in my backyard, and and from the the you know knowing picky, uh, you know. You can see from the morphology, and and quite easily we're quite sure that we didn't genotype it yet, uh, but ninety nine percent from the aroma profile and from the the, the macromorphology sure that this is a peaky strain. Sure, yeah. Um, but you, as I said before, we have sometimes collaborations. The one in New Zealand was to get done with a winery in New Zealand, where we get some fermenting grape juice from there, and then we pick through that. Uh, and and normally what you do is you put in an acre plate and get single colonies, and then you start to you know purify those through streaking on on Acre plate, uh, further acre plates uh, to make sure you have single pure colonies. Uh, you know, much like you know what they was done in Carlsberg uh, way way back. <laughs> right. It's, it's similar by you know this whole dogma about one colony originally from one uh, cell and and therefore being like constant in. Right, constant and, and and specific. Yeah, I mean, we just uh, we just uh, a couple episodes back, we talked with um, uh, some of the guys at, at Goose Island and also at Octopi, which is a brewery here in the United States. Um, uh, Tim Smith and Alec Nam, Alex Nam, um, about going out into the wild and harvesting. So they did that for Goose Island. They went on a camping trip and like swabbed a whole bunch of things while they were out camping, and then brought those back to Goose Island and made a beer with a uh, yeast that they were trying to to uh, to make. Now they were they actually got a Saccharomyces, I think. Um, they were looking very specifically for a yeast and not for anything else um but or maybe it wasn't i'm not actually sure what the species was maybe i need to send them in a, a, and ask them that question but you can go and harvest this out in your backyard um and use those techniques and put that in a you know in an auger plate and grow it up um and and see what you get and if it smells yeah, yeah, good but this stuff is all over the place so you can yeah. you can find it almost everywhere right so right right i think right. there's one one brewery that was it from the beard of the brewmaster they isolated at some point right in the U.S., as so, so yeast is is really everywhere. Um, when it comes to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, when it comes to Pichia, uh, I think the exception to that is uh, the lager yeast. Oh yeah, right. Mm-hmm. The Saccharomyces lager yeast, um, which has this uh, Urbanus uh, ancestry, right? Uh, where it's this hybrid. And uh, I think there was recently a paper published uh, by the Technical University of Munich where this this seems to have found the first time ever. Uh, the ancestor of the lager yeast in, in Europe, whereas it was isolated before that only in Patagonia, uh, right? So it's it's so some yeast are more you know depending on where you source them from, you you will get different species because as we talked about before with maltose, they might have you know they can only grow where there's the nutrients available that they need. So if if they for example pika can only grow places with monosaccharides where and would not be able to grow in in a spilled word or anything where saccharomyces would thrive. Uh, so you will have niches in, in in your backyard where you say maybe some flowers will have more of this yeast pieces, uh, but yeah, you can't see them. So it's you know it's a little bit of a lottery. You have to go out and you know try to pick whatever you can can find and then sort through it afterwards. Right. Well, and so that's that was going to be sort of my next question. That's a great segue. Are there challenges that with brewing this yeast? Because you said like some yeast have different nutritional requirements. You know, some yeast need oxygen. Some yeast need just the monosaccharide. So are there challenges with brewing with specialty yeast? Maybe we can use Peaky as an example. Yeah, that's not really a problem brewing it with it per se, but there might be problem propagating it, right? Because you don't have a lot of sugar in your your word, and that, uh, sorry, monosaccharides in your word, and that's what it wants to to grow on, uh, and and that's where we come in. So we basically produce the yeast and grow it in our big uh, bi reactors, and, and and we sell it in a, in a in a format where it comes as like a one kilo frozen block, and and one of the tricks that we found to making good non alcoholic beer with this specific yeast is that you can inoculate it very low. So one kilo block is enough for 500 hectoliters. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, okay. and that's because you only inoculate about one time 10 to the fifth CFU per mil. And then you use the initial fa- uh, part of the, the brewing or the fermentation. And of course, fermentation is quote unquote, because there is no fermentation because it's a crafty negative yeast. Uh, 
Um, so it's actually about just respiring the the, the the oxygen that came from the brew house. And while doing that, it's growing, and, and that really gives a nice flavor profile that it, it starts growing inside. Uh, and what also means that you can pitch a lot. That said, you know, as we already discussed, if psychomyces get in there, there's a big risk, and that's why we also recommend not to um, repitch it because the risk is simply too big to take it into a yeast spring or even tank to tank transfer. Will be you, there's no reason you couldn't do it, but I would say it was too risky. And since you can take a frozen new block every time, it, it's just so much more convenient, uh, and uh, that way you avoid the risk. Yeah, avoid the risk because if you get even uh, like one or two Saccharomyces cells, it's just going to take away. It's just going to go go crazy. It's just going to have a a, a party. <laughs> yeah, in the, exactly. In there. Yeah, um, and so so then I I have uh, one question which may lead into a second question, which is how long does the fermentation take then with specialty yeast like this? The fermentation in air quotes. <laughs> I'm I'm not so familiar with other non Saccharomyces because we work primarily with with Pika, but um, we for the the 0.5% alcohol beer, we normally see that it takes three to six days. Uh, but part of that is also you need mixing of the tank because, as we said, the, the number of yeast cells is very low. Uh, it only ferments the, the monosaccharides, meaning the amount of CO2, like the amount of ethanol, is, is less. So you don't get that convective mixing of your tank from the CO2 formation. Uh, so that combined with a very low cell count, you need to basically mix the content of the tank. And we normally do that in smaller tanks with a pump. So up to about 200, 250 hectoliters, taking it away from the side and putting it back through the cone. So we just create a circulation loop and, and that's enough. Bigger tanks, you would need some kind of dedicating mixing loop. And there's a, a couple of those uh, tank mixes that you can get, uh, which sits like a rotor jet inside the liquid. So bigger than 250 would recommend that. Uh, but but with those mixing things, we see that they're, if the mixing is good, three to four days. If it's not so good, five to six days. I see. Yeah, because it just takes a lot of time, right, uh, for the yeast to come into contact with those sugars. There's there's, no, there's low concentration of sugars and low concentration of yeast. So for them to come together and find each other, it takes a while, and you need to mix. Yep. That's a really good point too about the CO two mixing. Um, that that's not happening in these in these. Yeah. Uh, and then for now we talk about zero five, but for the zero point zero five, the trick is basically to keep the the yeast respiring, and here the mo- uh, the Crabtree effect comes into. Meaning, as long as there's oxygen present, the yeast will respire and not ferment, meaning you will not produce any ethanol. And what we do there is we basically utilize that we have this mixing loop, so we can distribute oxygen homogeneously throughout the tank and get it into solution. And and, and we can also put a sensor in there and control it, so we know exactly the amount of oxygen in there. And by adding oxygen, we basically force the yeast to respire and, and therefore grow, and it grows exponential. And that just speeds up the whole process. So normally, it takes a maximum of two days to get through a, a 0.0 beer. And I would say normally we start cooling within less than 24 hours because if you keep that going, it will be oily, aromatic, and, and not very pleasant. Uh, and if you do it too little, so a little bit of balance, you will still have some great aldehydes. But in general, that, that balance point where we see good results is somewhere between 20 and 24 hours. Wow, that's crazy. So so for it's actually to, it's shorter to make 0.0 beer or 0.05, right? The 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 0.0 beer because you you can continually add oxygen. So are you like dosing oxygen? Are you just like kind of like streaming oxygen in during like the mixing loop or are you just kind of like pulsing it in? In the beginning we we, we had, you know, operators just try manually measure and dosing and and we quickly realized, you know, that that's not going to fly anywhere. You cannot repeat the same beer and then you cannot have an operator doing that for 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, <laughs> so we we designed this uh, small system which we is portable which we actually travel with and take to brewers and it basically just hooks up a uh, optical dissolved oxygen sensor to a control box that then relays the signal to a server uh, that via a Wi-Fi connection relays all the info information to the cloud so we have access to the information in the cloud what the server also does it, it controls a, a solenoid valve that opens and closes the the oxygen supply and that way we can control the amount of oxygen we can basically have set points and it's it's a very simple system so far it's only on off regulation so we basically defined an upper and a lower set point meaning as soon as it goes below the lower set point it opens the valve and then when it reaches the upper set point it closes the valve again yeah yeah yeah, so I mean, it's basically just an oxygen sensor. You're just you know running it through the pump. You've got the oxygen sensor connected to what, where through the beer flow. So it's doing the the oxygen, and whenever the oxygen gets too low, it doses in a little bit of oxygen. Whenever it's too high, it stops. Or whenever it reaches that high set point, maybe not too high, but when it reaches that high set point, 
um, it stops. That's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool system. And so it's just kind of like automatically adding in the oxygen. And again, the, the, the key point here is that oxygen is necessary because you want yeast to be in that respiration phase um, in this point, right? Yes, we want to prevent the alcohol formation, and, and the way of doing it is dosing the alcohol. We always get you know these questions because most brewers they, they were taught in by Saccharomyces you don't want oxygen, you don't want anything besides the oxygen that you give from the brew house, you will get defects in the beer. But in general, we we keep the oxygen very low, and as I said, we keep it within like twenty four hours, so we, we haven't really seen any, any defects. Um, we have had sometimes issues with a little bit of diacetyl formation when we we give a lot of oxygen, and and we have solved that using the alpha acetyl. Uh, lactate decarboxylase, the enzyme that basically degrades the precursor for uh, diacetyl. And, and with that and in the combination of oxygen, you can prevent any diacetyl. So, so that has also worked really well. And again, as I said, you know, when you start doing these tricks that is a little bit alternative to what you would do in your regular brew house, there's both benefits, but there's also some drawbacks. But as long as you can find solution for the drawbacks, you're fine, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes me wonder too. Like, uh, you know, I mean, it's only a twenty, r- roughly twenty-four hour fermentation. But, um, you know, could you just have somebody like walking over there and kind of, you know, dosing every now and then um, some oxygen? Uh, you know, just like keep it open, like blow some oxygen into the tank, blow some oxygen into the tank. Maybe that's a really like low key, easy situation. Maybe it won't do as well as the the system that you guys have set up, but maybe it's good enough uh, for for some brewers. It could be. Uh, you know, in general, we have been doing these things with the, the system because we want repeatability. Exactly. And because yeah, that yeah. that would be my biggest concern that <laughs> you you don't get that repeatability and and you you have introduced variation in, in and you want to basically they could uh, be able to deliver the same beer every time to your consumer. You don't want to have big big differences from from batch to batch. Right. So, do the do um do the flavors change then by like using these different techniques, like uh, like the amount of oxygen or something, keeping the yeast in respiration versus like you know not in respiration? Does the actual flavor of the beer change? It, it changes a lot, and especially as I said, if you keep it going for a long time, but it seems to be the same flavors produced, but just in way way bigger amounts because there's more yeast cells producing them. So so we normally in the end we uh, it, it just become too much. I think there was a brewmaster in South America that called it 2D40 because it was simply like <laughs> it's just 2D fruity, it's overly just powerful, like uh, overwhelmingly that said, fruity. <laughs> they are overwhelmingly. But that said, as, uh, depending on how you design your, your recipe, you might be able to go a little bit into that regime because, like you can with regular beer, you can do, do high gravity brewing where you brew a little bit higher gravity than you, and get more ethanol than your your you want in your final beer. You can do the same thing with PK. You you can brew at eight plates and then dilute to six or five plates or after fermentation and there you might be able to have higher aroma and then dilute it with the water afterwards and then bring the aroma back in, to the level that you want yeah yeah exactly and, and that also improves your you know the utilization of your tank and as we said before with 24 hours to cooling and then maybe a day of cooling two days the throughput of, of your brewery, you know, skyrockets. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? I mean, high-gravity brewing is one of the easiest ways to increase your, your throughput, right, uh, by diluting at the end. Um, and so you said, like, kind of one of the main flavors of this, this tutti fruity, um, is kind of the extreme, but it's nicely, like, banana, apple, pear, uh, peach, I, I think you mentioned, is, is really um, an interesting fr- uh, fruity flavor that's coming from just using this yeast. Now, do you do anything else? Like, do you recommend with this yeast doing, like, um, uh, ma- like a high temperature mash or, you know, um, uh, and also maybe like what fermentation temperature for the yeast? So, yeah, as we discussed earlier, a high temperature mash is, is, is definitely a benefit. Um, we have tested quite a lot of temperatures. We see for regular like IPAs, um, pale ales, 16 to 18 degrees uh, works well. That said, we have had a brewery do 25 degrees by accident and that also worked, just became a little bit more fruity. Then we recently did some work where we tried 12 degrees for making a more lager-like uh, beers, and then we could actually subdue quite a lot of the aromas by by turning down the temperature. And even at 12 degrees, we could get it to work. That said, thing goes quite slow at 12 degrees, so, so therefore we need the oxygen to speed up things. But just because you dose the oxygen to make a zero zero beer doesn't mean you can not convert it afterwards. So you can get the best of both worlds. You can add the oxygen to speed up the process. And you can cap the oxygen in the end when you're happy uh, because then the yeast will stop respiring and start fermenting and then it will use the rest of the, the monosaccharides to make less than 0.5% alcohol. But still, you'll get the speed and you'll still get the alcohol. And just a little bit of alcohol also helps with the aldehydes. Uh, but that said, 
cooling and, and adding oxygen, of course, you would be afraid that there's residual oxygen when you cool the beer. And one of the observations that we made is that even at one degree Celsius, this yeast still assimilate oxygen. So even though there's a little bit of oxygen left, if the yeast is still in the product when you start cooling, it will take up every little last bit of oxygen that is, is, is left in there. Ah, interesting. So the yeast is going to consume the oxygen anyway, right? I, even, it, even if it's at one degree Celsius, the yeast is going to continue to take up the oxygen. Yeah, it's, it's really very good at assimilating oxygen, which is, of course, a bonus when you do these things and start playing around with oxygen. You need to have some way of mobbing it up and, and make sure that you don't have any because where I see oxygen is, and the problem is probably on the shelf life. You don't want any oxygen in your package final product because that is going to cause you problem. But a little bit during the process doesn't seem to do a lot of harm, if any at all. That's good. Yeah, and and the yeast can clean up anything that's left residually. And, and you you did mention um, another thing there too. You mentioned the aldehyde uh, cleaning up, and I didn't want to forget about that. So so how is this? Uh, so is Pikia doing good a good job of like also reducing aldehydes? Yes, it's doing a really good job. We have uh, tested it uh, also industrially where we sent uh, samples for analysis and, and it seems that it is in general these, I think it's a set of eight or ten aldehydes you normally look for in beer and, and all of those were, were significantly reduced over the period of the, the fermentation. Mm. Yeah, good. So that means that the wort is going to be le- not, not er, I'm sorry, that the beer is going to be not wort flavored and not, not that like starchy, um, uh, I don't know, like papery, cardboardy, uh, potato <laughs> kind of flavor. Yeah, and in general, you can really avoid having this uh, grainy um, uh, malty beers with, with this yeast. Yes, that's, that's for sure. Yeah, that's that's and then well, what about like a pH? Uh, do you need to do any pH adjustments or like what you know recommendations there for using this yeast? Yeah, so so we we like to adjust the pH um, and we see that it normally don't drop a lot in these processes. For the zero five, it drops 0. 0.2 to 0. 0.3 pH units. So normally, also for as we discussed earlier, food safety, we like to at the end of the boil add lactic or phosphoric acid or a mix of the two, depending on the flavor profile you want to hit. Uh, and drop it below below 4.5, 4.6, because within, with a 2.3% drop, you'll end up at 4.2, 4.3. Uh, and that way, you will also eliminate most bacteria for growing in there by having the, the low pH. Uh, for the, the zero syrup beer, we see a little bit higher pH drop, but 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 still, because the process is so fast, that the risk is much smaller than you would have in your, your 0.5% alcohol beer. But still, it's it's easy, and especially for the first couple of trials, if you have a little bit of lactic acid on hand to adjust it the post fermentation if you're not completely happy and and especially acids and and uh, hops for bittering becomes very important when we talk about uh, the residual maltose giving residual sweetness and and recreating that balance or, or finding the balance for this new style of beer requires that you, you play a little bit around and 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 there doing some work post fermentation is is also very helpful yeah, 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 exactly. Like doing some work P- uh, post fermentation to see about your pH. But it's interesting. So you, you are recommending say, sort of uh, adjust that pH down before fermentation. So Pikia then isn't necessarily pH tolerant, at, or I mean, isn't a pH intolerant at those levels. Like it operates fine at that four or five uh, pH range. Yeah, it came from a wine segment, and you know, wine is it's much lower as three point five. We have a brewery now in Denmark even doing uh, some uh, non-alcoholic sour beer with it. So they, they use another, another one of our products, which is uh, a Harvest W1. It's a uh, lactobacillus plantarum and to do kettle sour. And then instead of fermenting the, the, the sour word, they use, with the regular saccharomyces, they use the pica to ferment the sour word from the kettle. And that way they create a, a non-alcoholic sour beer. <laughs> Oh, interesting. A non-alcoholic sour. Oh, wow. I hadn't yeah. even I hadn't even thought about that. My mind's blown a little bit. Now I'm really curious about doing that, too. We've been talking a lot about sour beers as well on the podcast. Um, and so that, that, that's uh, that's cool. So use the pikia to ferment the uh, the 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 kettle sour. Um, so it's a non-alcoholic actual kettle sour. Yeah. And they, they added a lot of the different fruits and that also the acidity of the fruit puree so would help balance some of the sweetness. And yeah, it, it, it works really well. They are some of my my favorite and non alcoholic beers. Yeah, so sour and sour and fruity. Now, all right, I I have a, a question. Then I was I didn't wasn't planning on asking you this question, but the fruit. Then when you add the fruit to the fermentation, that fruit is going to add a lot of the monosaccharides, right? Or like sucrose and glucose and and fructose. Or do you have to worry about additional fermentation that happens whenever you add fruit fruit purees? Yes, and and, and they would probably most of the time they don't add it to the fermentation itself. They add it. Post fermentation, the bright tank where everything is cold and you have already separated most of the pika yeast out, 
and then they package it and then they they try and pasteurize it and stabilize it that way. Yeah, I see. So adding the fruit puree at the end after everything's cold and most of the piki has been uh, been pulled out. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I see. Yeah, well, that's that's really smart. Okay, and then um, one last question I think on the on the piki then is hops. Um, so let's talk hot side bittering and let's talk also dry hopping. Um, does it how you know does piki have any sensitivity to hop or or does it matter or it play well with hops and and what are your recommendations for you know hopping schedules with this? It seems to play very well with hops and uh, yeah, we haven't seen any problem with hop t- uh, tolerance. It, it seems to tolerate all the levels we have been throwing at it and we. Have, been doing quite some IPAs, uh, and our customer has been doing quite some IPAs with it, so that doesn't seem to be a problem. Dry hopping, where that can be problematic, is you might risk introducing brewer's yeast when you do your dry hop, mm, yeah, and, okay. and that of course would create alcohol. So we ha- we have made beers that is dry hopped, but there we normally recommend doing it like six to twelve hours before starting cooling. Uh, we had a brewery that did dry hop the beer and then left it over the weekend and there the alcohol just went above spec because <laughs> they introduced some yeast oh. when they dry hop the beer yeah yeah i mean anything that's present on those hops will uh, could potentially do it yeah there, and there could be saccharomyces cerevisiae present on the hops right there'd be maybe no reason why there wouldn't be it could absolutely be there um and then ferment that's really interesting so so dry hopping um just non-alcoholic beers in general is a challenge right <laughs> because you're going to introduce yeast species potentially introduce yeast species into this situation but i like that recommendation the six to twelve hours before cooling so essentially even if there was yeast um that was introduced it's gonna uh not have a a lot of opportunity to grow and ferment alcohol and and make a huge change if you're that close to whenever you're going to cool it down and cooling it down you mean cooling it all the way down to you know uh, packaging temperatures down to like zero one degree celsius yes and and here's important because some brewers they like to cold cool the beer to below zero right Uh, and normally they can do that because of the alcohol but but don't do that with non alcoholic beer. Then you have a huge popsicle. <laughs> That's right. He will. You have a frozen beer. That's a very good point. Yeah, you gotta you've got to get higher than than uh, than uh, yeah one degree. You don't even want to hit zero degrees Celsius, right? Because then you might you might freeze the beer. Yeah, because there's a variation in your cooling system, and you will see fluctuations. So so yeah, above one degree, preferably. Above one degree, exactly, and so the pikia will fall out then, and the and the the saccharomyces will fall out, and so that's kind of a good good way. So six to twelve hours before ch- ch- chilling it down, if you want to add. To the Actually, pikia doesn't really fluctuate, so it, it will fall out, but very very slowly, uh, and that's why we really recommend also that you have a centrifuge and you 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 send it through the centrifuge. The the cell size is a bit smaller than saccharomyces, uh, so it's a little bit more difficult. To, but we have seen with modern centrifuges that they can easily remove the majority and it's it's not really a problem. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. And and I guess if you don't have access to a centrifuge or filter or something like that, l- leaving the pikia in maybe the best way is in to pasteurize once you've got it in the package. That'll also kill the pikia, but then also um, make sure that there's nothing else in the beer that's going to cause an issue. Yeah. So I would be a little bit concerned having too much pikia in, in, in the beer when pasteurizing because the yeast lysis will give some all flavors. But that's, but that's it for zero zero it's also important to take off the the yeast because you need to as i said stock the fermentation because as soon as the oxygen depletes you will start to form alcohol so after that happens if you need to cool it before that happens and then send it for a centrifuge to separate off these as quickly as possible but the zero five on the other hand it has consumed all the fermentable monosaccharides meaning that the yeast will just sit there dormant so you could actually keep it there we had a brewery that actually managed to keep the beer for more than a month in a, in a storage tank cold without alcohol going out of uh, spec. Huh. <laughs> so yeah, it's um Yeah, so so I guess I, I guess the, the the pasteurizing thing then uh, you know you you would uh, have some off flavors from lysing the yeast from destroying the yeast um or the the pikia that's still in solution. So that's interesting. So so it sounds like you do need to like centrifuge uh, it, it out to like really pull it out of uh, of the beer. Yeah, especially for zero zero but, but for zero 05 we have been thinking about maybe you could use fining agents. We haven't had an opportunity to try it yet, but I don't see why not. If you can keep it cold and you can keep it for, for a long time, like a month, as I just mentioned, it should be possible to settle it out using fining agents. 
Oh, interesting. That's an interesting idea. So yeah, I'll be interested to hear uh, the results of that if you're able to use finding agents to help uh, settle it out. So I think there's a lot of breweries out there that don't necessarily have access to centrifuging equipment, or at least not easy access to centrifuging equipment. So that would be a great, great benefit um, if that was able to if that was able to happen. All right. So we've talked about a lot of different, um, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about Pikia Cluveri today, which is a, a, a maltose negative and crabtree negative yeast. And we talked about yeast metabolism and, and what the crabtree effect is and what maltose is and why yeast consume maltose and how they're good at it. Um, if you want brewers to take away just one thing from today's episode, what would it be? I think it was what I also mentioned earlier that, you know, it's a little bit more tricky to make a non alcohol beer and, and, and don't despair if you don't get it right the first time. It's about, you know, learning to rebalance so to say uh, the beer so normally we see that it takes two or three trials uh, to get it right uh, and then you know just spend that time and the effort like you would on your regular beer and, and, and you will also get there with your non-alcoholic beer and you'll be able to make really good non-alcoholic beer and we have seen brewers that you know in australia that now this the second best selling product is actually a non-alcoholic beer <laughs> wow. and then as we discussed the market is growing so so really i, I would say you know don't be discouraged it, it is a little bit more difficult but it is also worth the effort yeah, yeah, it's worth the effort. Don't be discouraged. You can do it. <laughs> you can make non-alcoholic beer. And listen to this podcast and take all of the episodes or uh, take all of the advice that uh, that Simon has given today, um, especially if you want to use the Pikia Cluveri or the specialty yeast. I love the idea, too, of the combining the methods, right? Combine the production methods with the specialty yeast, and then maybe you can make something that's very nice and very pleasant and that you're proud of in terms of uh, a non-alcoholic beer. Well, Simon, we talked about a bunch of things. Is there anything else that that you wish to share that we didn't get to today? No, but I think, we, as you said, we talk about it a lot, and uh, I just want to mention, you know, we are very happy to help, and you can always reach out to me or my colleagues uh, at Christian Hansen, and, you know, yeah, let's make some awesome beers together. Yeah, let's make some good beers together. Well, Simon, thank you so much for joining me in the Brew Lab. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's been an awesome experience. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad to have you as well. And it's all right. Next week, Jordan and I will be back applying the science to this episode, and we will see y'all then. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit Brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit Patreon.com slash Brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer.